Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the... Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. Of course, this is a monthly book review. Each month, I am joined by a different guest co-host, and this month's co-host most likely is no stranger to a lot of you listening, for he is a popular chess author. He's been on the podcast before, episode 209, as an accomplished adult improver. He's also our second consecutive Danish dad. Uh, By day, he works as an archivist in the Library of the Danish Parliament, but of course, he has written a few chess books, and he's got another one on the way. On the way, he is the founder and the CEO of the Say Chess Publishing Empire, as we will discuss. But today, what we're going to be talking about is the book "Questions of Modern Chess Theory" by Isaac Lipnitsky. Uh, this was a book that was published in the USSR in 1956, and it's kind of like a deep cut classic. It's uh, for those who know, it's. Um, Totally respected, and we'll talk about some of the uh, chess legends who have spoken highly of this book. But first, let's uh, welcome uh, Martin Eustacen back to Perpetual Chess. Martin, uh, how are you? I'm fine, Ben. Thank you for uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, this uh, interview and uh, and big book recap. And I've been uh, looking forward to it. And uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm I'm very uh, humbled by calling my, my small uh, book business uh, an empire, but uh, <laughs> it's become a, a fun joke here on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Perpetual Podcast. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's good that you explained. So that's become a bit of a running joke. Martin, of course, is a good exemplar for a lot of chess fans in that he's rated about 1,800 feet, a, um, but has managed to build a successful side hustle, hustle sort of uh, pursuing his passion for chess, but also giving to the chess community in the books that he has produced. And uh, a lot of you may be familiar with his Blindfold Endgame visualization book or his uh, redone Capablanca book. Of course, we recapped the Capablanca book um, quite recently. And as I said, he's got a new one on the way. But Martin, in addition to uh, he shares so much with the chess community. So it's nice to see that the jokes about it being an empire aside, it is uh, an admirable and um, uh, beneficial uh, side hustle. But the order of the day, Martin, uh, is, of course, uh, questions of modern chess theory. And yeah. when we had talked about reviewing a book this month, this one was your suggestion. So what was it about this book, Martin, that that made you think it might be a good choice? Um, I think uh, it was mainly because um, you reviewed um, uh, Nimsowitz's My System uh, in a previous re- recap, and uh, I had also uh, read that book uh, uh, this summer, and uh, I thought that it was uh, would be a nice continuation. And and also, um, when I started my my, my YouTube channel uh, some, uh, some some years ago, uh, it it was with the goal to uh, to cover this book from uh, front to cover. Uh, and uh, it was something that I never managed to uh, to accomplish. <laughs> um, but uh, but then I thought, okay, this is a, a, an excellent opportunity to uh, to to finish the book and uh, get something out of it. And uh, yeah. Uh, and I can maybe say that, like the reason I it caught my notice was after reading uh, Frank uh, Brady's book uh, Endgame uh, about uh, Bobby Fischer, um, where I think he uh, he says that uh, Fischer uh, hold, uh, read this book uh, in Ru- in the Russian uh, edition, um, maybe with some help from his uh, his mother, um, but. Um, yeah, and and I think uh, Brady says that uh, uh, it, it was a very important book for for Bobby Fischer. So, and uh, since I'm uh, very interested in, in in Bobby Fischer and his life, I thought that there was would be an interesting book to uh, to read. Yeah, Karpov also was a big fan and wrote uh, one of the forewords. And yeah, the legend goes with Fisher that that it was one of the primary books that helped him learn to be able to read Russian. He, of course, was legendarily a uh, voracious chess reader. And back in those days, uh, 
Chessable and YouTube didn't exist. So that was how you were getting your information. And yeah, Fisher, I believe, quoted this book in 60 Memorable Games at some point. Um, and uh, and yeah, was a big fan. And, and digging in, I can see why. I can also see why it's compared to my system. Um, of course, uh, listeners who heard, I am Christoph Selecki and I recap <clears throat> my system. Um, well, have heard that we had, I guess, to mixed feelings about the book. We feel like it didn't hold up that well. And so I don't, so without further ado, I'll just say I didn't feel that way about this book. I mean, it felt quite modern. Um, and it's, it's sort of similar style to my system in that it covers a lot of different chess topics. It's not about one small thing, but it also doesn't try to cover everything. But it's, um, it's, it's quite impressive. Well, is that your overall impression as well, Martin? Yeah, I, I agree, Ben. Uh, and uh, I think the, the difference between my system and, and, and this book is like it's um, uh, questions of modern chess theory is a lot more uh, concrete, I think. Uh, and uh, while my system is uh, it's like like Nimsa, which tried to uh, explain everything in, 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 in chess and, and like um and co like in a, like a big nature system with uh, organisms and he talks about a, a chess game as an, an organism and how it develops uh, as a like a living thing and and i think this this is uh, this is a totally different kind of book uh, where um uh, lipnitsky is a lot more uh, down to the point i think well said. Yeah, clearer prose, no crazy diagrams, none of uh, <laughs> yeah. Nimzovich's eccentricities. And to be fair, this book did come out decades later than my yeah. system, published in 1956 in the USSR. And another point of interest about this book, one reason that I think a lot of people listening uh, may not have heard of it, again, for, for hardcore chess fans, this book is considered a classic, but it, it doesn't come up like if you just think about how often books are recommended on this podcast. It hasn't come up that often. And I think a, a big part of the reason why is it was only translated to English in 2008. Yeah, um, it's amazing. By, quali by quality chess. Yeah. Uh, so that obviously... Um, you know, limited the impact. Not all of us are like Fisher. Not all of us can can learn Russian just to read this book. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it, I can see why it gets compared to my system, but uh, but I, but I, I, I would prefer. I would say that that like I'm I'm happy. I, I read the, my system uh, first, and 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 this then the questions of modern chess theory afterwards because I, I felt like I needed some of the information in in uh, my system to, to like. Um, to to build on or maybe to re-understand in in a new way uh, because uh, Lipnitsky is, is a it's like trying to uh, like theorize about some of the the, the ideas of uh, hyper hyper modern modernism uh, like so which is the school of Nimsovich uh, so it's a uh, it's a new take on those idea of uh, of the center and how to attack the center and yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot more details to get into. One question I feel like we should answer early, just for anyone listening and wondering, is for what level chess player do you think this book would be most beneficial? <clears throat> what do you What do you think, Martin? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely not a beginner's book, uh, and and um, in I would I would say like it's uh, it's advanced material, uh, but. There's also some a, a lot of great games that uh, intermediate players could could benefit on off, but it's not really written for for like uh, the 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 beginner intermediate player. I think it's it's written for the the peers of of his time, and that's, uh, that's how I get it. It's a very short introduction in the book, so um, but I, I feel like he's writing for 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 the chess masters and. In, in at his time yeah i agree it's the again the language is not inaccessible so that means no. that probably a lot of people can read it and at least pick up a few things but in terms of like maximizing the utility of the books you read i would guess for say 1800 Lee Chess Rapid, meaning 1500 FIDE slash USCF slash chess.com, something like that. In that general ballpark is where it, I would think it starts to, to make the most sense 
for you to devote your time to reading uh, this book. Uh, if you're trying to categorize it in terms of some other books that often get recommended on this podcast, I would definitely, re I, I don't want to reread my system, unlike you. So I, I wouldn't include that in the conversation, but I might do something like logical chess move by move before this, winning chess strategies before this, simple chess maybe right before this. And I would say, and you know, obviously game collections can go somewhere in there as well, but I would say this could come somewhere after that. I would place it firmly in the intermediate category. But if there's things you don't understand, uh, I don't feel like you would be like totally lost because it's not necessarily going to be a language issue. It's more just uh, that familiar feeling of not knowing why a certain move that isn't <clears throat> explained isn't explained. And, yeah. you know, that's part of chess learning. So, um, so yeah. And, and in terms of like a ceiling, you know, I'm 21, 20, 2200 at peak and there's plenty to learn from this. I was, uh, I was amazed by his games. Uh, and there's, we'll talk more about the, uh, the format of the book in a minute, but. Um, yeah. And I, I think one of the reasons I, I said, like, it's maybe more to, towards advanced. It's like, it's because it's not, I don't feel like it's a, like a standard alone book where you get the whole package. It's like building blocks that you can add to something you already have uh, read some uh, about just yeah, and it's and and because it's um it's not a tactics workbook, you know, it's there's a lot of pros. Um I think that often leaves like some more wiggle room in terms of uh of when you can read it. Um because no matter your level from 1500 to 2200, there's certainly things you'll pick up um from it. Um so we're going to share a few more details about the book and then we're going to um and a few more details about the author, and then we're going to dig deeper. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. Listeners, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is I'm still stuck at being behind on the clock in 77% of my Blitz games, neither getting better nor worse, just spinning my wheels endlessly. The good news is, unlike me, Aim Chess has managed to improve its product even more. They've totally redesigned the interface of aimchess.com. They've added the ability to use Aim Chess even if you don't have a linked account on chess.com, Lee Chess, or Chess24. They've expanded payment options to include Google Pay and Apple Pay. So doing everything they can to make Aim Chess even more user-friendly and fun, accessible, and educational. So if you haven't already, be sure to check out aimchess.com. And as always, use the code PERPETUAL30 to receive a 30% discount if you decide to subscribe. And we are back. So we mentioned that uh, Karpov wrote one of the forewords. Another foreword was written by Grandmaster John Shaw of Quality Chess. Of course, this was reissued by Quality Chess. One detail listeners should know is, as far as I can tell, there is not an electronic version of this book. I couldn't find it on Forward Chess, even though a lot of Quality Chess's books are on Forward Chess. Um, and I couldn't find one in my Googling. So that was a bit unfortunate. And it I've mentioned before in some other books, such as last month's uh, A First Book of Morphe, that there was like a Lee Chess study where even if you didn't have um, an electronic version, you could just have the Lee Chess study open and play through the moves. Um, it seems like a couple people on Lee Chess have attempted that. But even that, there's really there's no getting around this being kind of analog book. Um, you can find most of the games that are cited if you Google them on chessgames.com. So I often, um, you know, would would perform the heretical task of uh, looking at the games on my phone um, while uh, while reading the pros. Um, you also, if you want to improve your visualization, of course, it's a classic way to try to do that, just to go from diagram to diagram without playing the moves. Um, there'll probably be some understanding sacrificed, but um, it is a good way to improve your visualization skills. And qu as quality chess usually does, there's a decent number of diagrams, but, um, but you are going to need to get a paper book if you... Uh, if you get this one, did you actually use a chess set for reading this, Martin? Um, I, I most mainly I, I, I used a chess set for some of the games, but uh, otherwise I, I used a, a board on my phone to uh, to play through uh, because uh, sometimes I read on the train and and uh, in places where I can't really put up a a, a board. So uh, on my phone and and. 
at, that was one of the things I was a little bit uh, annoyed by the book was like uh, he some places he starts on the, on the first moves of the the game and then he jumps to another game and then he goes back to see the ending of the first game he he uh, uh, he talked about so and so there's a little bit jumping around when you don't have the the digital uh, version uh, uh, available so it takes a little bit time to switch through um, uh, the games. Yeah, and also there's some game snippets. Um, yeah. So some full games, but when there's a game snippet, obviously that limits your ability to just pull up like a, a lead chess or chess.com analysis board and input the moves. Of course, if you want to um, be diligent, you can either use an app like Chessify and take a picture from your book and then it'll input the position and then you play it from there on an analysis board, or obviously you could set it up yourself. But we're already talking about something uh, labor intensive. So so yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say if you can pull it off, this is a book. And it, it's it's written in a style such that, you know, and being such a old treasured book, there's there's definitely something to be said for reading it properly with a with a chess set. But yeah, as neither of us uh, busy dads managed to pull that off. <laughs> um, so um so what do we need to know? Of course, in addition to the book not being well known, uh, Isaac Lipnitsky himself is far from a household name in the chess world. So uh, what should listeners who aren't familiar with him know, Martin? Mm, I think he, like a uh, Ukrainian uh, chess player, died very young, uh, 30, 35 years old, I think. So he had a lot of uh, uh, chess uh, years uh, missing from his life. Uh, as, and and yeah, he he he, be, uh, he won against uh, all, almost all the strong players of his time, uh, but uh, never really got the chance on the international scene. Uh, maybe because of the the USSR bureaucracy, but uh, yeah, um, and he 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 was uh, decorated as a soldier during the the Second World War. Uh, so he he also lost some years there where he. Uh, uh, obviously, couldn't play uh, play any chess. Um, yeah, and 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 what I can read from the introduction, he he wasn't a a, a wealthy man. Uh, uh, he 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 lived in yeah. Uh, it was not the it didn't sound like he had so much money. Yeah, so definitely um, didn't have as much opportunity. Um, he mm -hmm. was an author and a chess teacher uh, as his work, as was fairly common, learned chess at the, the House of Pioneers in uh, Kiev, Ukraine. And he was two-time Ukraine Ukrainian champion in uh, 1949 yeah. and, and 1956. But as you say, uh, untitled, like not even, a, an, of course, this is back when titles were, were pretty rare. So um, I, I read somewhere that it's estimated that he was, you know, in the top half dozen players in the Ukraine, which of course is a, you know, historical chess powerhouse but yeah i guess would have been called a candidate master but again when you play as when you play through his games i mean at least yeah. international master strength i mean he beat kiras mislav petrosian uh and and his writing is very clear he's a, he's a very strong player and yeah unfortunate that he died of uh, leukemia at, at 35 because um who knows what, what other contributions he could have left behind this is uh such such an amazing book Definitely. Um, uh, so, one thing I thought that was interesting in the, the introduction to the book was uh, that there was a, a woman, a, a Ukrainian chess player, Senior Weisberg, that was uh, editor of the book, and uh, and and she she uh, asked uh, Lipnitsky, "Why do you write that in some critical positions there aren't any chess laws that apply?" I mean, if some quest, uh, some laws don't apply, it means there are others that do, and 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 I find that interesting because it feels like that when you read the book, it, it's it's uh, it's this uh, weighing of chess laws is, uh, is is quite important concept in the book, um, in in his approach. Yeah. So this idea that like any rule you hear like a knight on the rim is dim or castle your king early or you know doubled pawns are bad or um you know outposts are strong or whatever it may be 
that generally these can be helpful guidelines, but the devil's in the details. And when you watch top players play, they're breaking these rules all the time. This, of course, is um, a point highlighted famously by I am John Watson in Secrets of Modern Chess Strategy. And if you read, there aren't a ton of online reviews um, of uh, of Lipnitsky's book, but it does often get sort of compared or mentioned in the same way because, of course, this preceded Watson's book um, by nearly 50 years. But what Watson called this idea of rule independence, meaning the, the great players know when to break the rules, as you say, Martin, it's a common theme throughout this book. And, um, and a lot of people were trying to like compare the books against each other. Um, I haven't read Watson's book in a while, but I found them to be different. I think I've mentioned before, I, I really like Watson's book, but to me, it's almost more like an academic type book. It's almost more like a, um, a historical development rather than a how-to guide. Whereas to me, I was really impressed, first of all, with the fact that, again, this was written so, you know, so much before Watson's book, but also it's more about like, it's more concrete in my opinion. I don't know if you've read Watson's book, but you could speak generally about uh, if you felt this was like a, a helpful actual chess guide rather than just like an academic, um, you know, um, um, questioning book. Yeah. I haven't read the uh, Watson's book, uh, but uh, I sh maybe I should uh, soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely, I feel like it's uh, it's it's not not uh, uh, too uh, academic in in any way, and uh, it's. Um, but he he goes into this uh, debate about uh, like uh, dogmatism in chess and versus uh, the the more uh, uh, concrete. Uh, uh, intuitive uh, and the weighing of uh, the, the chess laws against each other and uh, and yeah so 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 i just thought that was an interesting uh, perspective that this ukrainian women's champion uh, uh, had a, a, what i think a, a, a big impact on 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 the layout of the book yeah and and you can see this idea in action there's one game in particular we should mention format wise, by the way, that this book is what Quality Chess translated and republished is a truncated version of the original. Apparently, there were like like tons of pages about his thoughts on the theory of the Rogozin opening included and uh, Quality Chess um, decided that, you know, uh, you know, at this point, almost 70 year old chess theoretical opinings didn't really belong in a sort of reworking of the book. So they cut all that out. In my opinion, it's a wise decision, even though like maybe from a historical perspective, someone might be interested. But what they added was 12 of his games, more or less with his own annotations. Um, so they added them as an appendix. And again, those games are amazing. And he's, he's got a game in there where he beat Petrosian and, uh, those of you listening who heard my recent interview with with uh, Grandmaster Matthew Sadler will have heard him mention. Obviously, there's this recent procl proclivity with the strongest engines in the world uh, to to treat kings differently, treat how you play with your king differently than players did in the past. And he mentioned uh, GM Sad Sadler mentioned a recent game of uh, Ferruja's from the the Euro Cup where he does this big sort of king walk in the middle game. Well, in this game against Petrosian, actually. Yeah. Um, Lipnitsky does this. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to explain in audio only, but um, basically it's a, a, a middle game with queens on the board, although some pieces are off and it's a fairly locked structure. And before transitioning to the end game, he walks his king from the king side to the queen side. Uh, yeah. And I just haven't seen many games from that era. No, uh, it's an amazing game. I, I hadn't seen it before and I was like, uh, wow, this 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 is uh, just a, a very long a king march uh, to uh, to uh, to to pull off and a you know, great game uh, yeah amazing yeah. game and to to beat the legend petrosian and for any uh for any aspiring content creators out there i didn't see a lot of youtube videos about that game so uh <laughs> so someone should get on that because yeah, yeah it's, do it better uh, than me because <laughs> it's uh it's impressive stuff yeah but um, i can maybe add that i looked up the the reviews of the book on on amazon and that was like uh, 25 uh, or more uh, five stars reviews of the book and then there was one one star review and uh, and that that uh, guy he wrote that uh, about the reason why he didn't uh, didn't give uh, it more stars was because uh, 
of uh, removing the, the the regression part of the book and he, he writes that after all you don't throw away mona lisa from the louvre because uh, being 500 years old she is well kind of outdated uh, so uh, uh, as I, I i kind of understand where he's coming from but uh, yeah i i'm just curious like how how did the book uh, look uh, in, in, in its entirety um, with and how much editing did the uh, did the uh, quality uh, it just uh, do it to the book because yeah i'm i'm just uh, from like a, a historical perspective maybe like interested to see how much uh, was removed from this uh, this this book yeah we'd have to ask uh, douglas griffin or another russian speaker yeah. um exactly how it compares or whoever we should give a shout out to whoever actually did the translating but i mean you know you can't please everyone to me it's no. like <clears throat> to me it's full stop no brainer i don't want 150 pages of old theory in there you know and yeah. i'm interested i'm interested in chess history but like i i and most people when they buy a chess book you know the majority of the people are at least hoping you know their primary goal is probably to to learn some chess yeah. um so yeah, trans, uh, translated from Russian by John Sugden. So paging, paging John Sugden. Um, <laughs> so I also wanted to read again. The the intros were were pretty pretty fun. They definitely got you fired up for the book. So before we take one more break, I wanted to read what uh, Grandmaster John Shaw of uh, the aforementioned Quality Chess wrote. Um, so John writes, he writes, there's a great difference between merely acquiring information and achieving real understanding. In this book, you'll find much that is as vibrant and relevant as ever because Lipnitsky wrote with intelligence and lucidity. He was a champion who could play chess and explain how he played chess. Technology might have changed the way we look at chess, but pieces still move in the same way they did 60 years ago. Many highly acclaimed modern chess writers, especially those from Eastern Europe, proudly acknowledge Lipnitsky's influence on their work. Though he does not have the name recognition in the West of, as such established brands as Nimzowicz, Reddy, or Kotov, he is worthy of a place in the pantheon. Studying Lipnitsky's will make it easier for the reader to make the leap from the ideas of Nimzowicz to works by Lipnitsky's modern admirers, such as, just to choose one example, those of I am Mark Dvoretsky. So well said by John. I agree with every every word of it. Um, yeah. It's a it's a really good book. Um, so we're gonna talk about our favorite parts and uh, maybe share a few more quotes. But first, we're gonna take uh, one more break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud, as always, to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Of course, Chessable is constantly dropping new courses. Some of their latest include Keep It Simple for Black by I am Christoph Selecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain. It gives an entire repertoire for black no matter what you face, and Christoph is always thorough yet not overloading you with variations. There is also a brand new Lifetime Repertoires Berlin Defense from former U.S. champion GM Sam Shanklin. I hate playing against the Berlin, so I'd rather you not get that one. But hey, if you're looking to learn it, of course, Sam Shanklin does not mess around with his course offerings. And of course, whatever you choose to study on Chessable, you can utilize their proprietary move trainer technology to help you remember the lines you learn. So be sure, as always, to go to chessable.com and take a look at what's new. And we are back. And just to share a few more details on the book, there's 16 chapters. Some of the topics are like on the opening, the center, the center and the flanks, evaluating the position. And then there's the, aff the aforementioned appendix with uh, games of his, which actually turned out to be my favorite part um, of, of all. Now, Martin, when, when you read this book, did any particular segments or chapters stand out to you as your personal favorites? Um, yeah, I, I think... Uh... The the chapter on uh, the, the the second chapter on the center and the third chapter on the the center and the flanks uh, did an impact on me uh, because um, I felt like he he uh, explained the uh, the concept in a, in a, in a good way uh, and uh, also I kind of uh, got a picture of the like the development of uh, the understanding of the center that it's not just uh in in his view it's not just uh, getting the pawns to uh, uh e4 e5 d uh, d4 d5 uh, but it's 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 more like a struggle for the sense that in the in the sense that that you 
uh, need to be able to to keep the center if you want you if you engage to take the center uh, and if you let that your opponent take the center you you need to be able to to fight the center um, and uh, yeah i think uh, that those chapters were good um and um yeah, I, I just while you while you're looking for your next point, I'll just highlight that that I agree with that. And I've noticed that that below, like, you know, say below 17, 1800, the 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 importance of the center, um, I feel like it still gets uh, underestimated. I mean, obviously, I am Andres Toth. I'm a big fan of his work and his chessable course on the center. And that's one way to get like a, a amazing insights into uh into just how important it is. But but this book, again, as Martin said, there's just so many cool examples of situations where one side has either um, make sure the center is closed before they op- they take um, take operations on the wing or, you know, switch sides of the board. Um, again, it's this it's hard to do it justice on on a podcast, but I, I enjoyed that chapter as well. Um, I also like the idea, one of his chapters uh, relates to the idea of critical and settled positions, um, which I had heard in recent discourse often referred to as sort of uh, dynamic as opposed to static advantages. But this is the earliest mention I've seen of sort of this concept where you can have an advantage in a position where if you don't find the right sequence, uh, the advantage can just di- dissipate. Or if it's like an end game and your opponent has a terrible pawn structure or something, this is an example of something that he would refer to as a settled position where time is less of the essence. The the advantage is, is there to, to be exploited over sort of a, a large number of moves. And he has a lot of uh, great instructive examples of like <clears throat> ways to sort of be on the lookout for that in, in your yeah. games. Yeah, it, 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 that was also a, like, yeah, like the settled position is uh, where you, you look at the, the positional principles and then the critical is where you apply calculation. And, and I could only say when reading some of the examples, it was like a, to, he, he says like the aim is to go for one, for one settled position to, to an, a new settled position in your calculations. And, and some of the example was, I was just like, okay, I'm never going to get <laughs> this far in my own, uh, try to, uh, to reach a settled position, but, uh, but, but I understand the concept and I, I think it's a, a good way to think about, um, um, uh, chess. Yeah. And another standout chapter for me is he has one on evaluating the position, which again, uh, hearkening back to my recent interview with Grandmaster Matthew Sadler, that was another thing he highlighted about the modern engines is their how good their evaluation function is. And I saw a few people mention online that that's something that they feel like they they struggle with in, in their own games. So he he has some useful tips for that, and he all shared this quote that Lipnitsky wrote, which is the the art of correctly and objectively appraising a position is the decisive factor in a player's skill which prompts him to take the correct decision. Yes, appraising the position is ob- objectively is fairly difficult, especially in the conditions of practical play with limited thinking time for your moves. The extremely important idea that a player's idea that a player's actions should flow from a correct assessment of the position was elaborated for the first time by the world chess champion Wilhelm Steinitz. And then he's got some Steinitz games or game snippets in there. Um, it's, um, yeah, definitely yeah. instructive. Yeah, and like, and then he also mentions like, uh, I think it's a cable match against uh, Chigorin against Steinitz, where it's like a clash of uh, the old school against uh, Chigorin, who is he he uses it as like an example of a uh, an intuitive player uh, that uh, that. It's better at uh, like juggling with uh, these uh, chess principles, uh, and whereas maybe uh, Steinitz was a little bit more uh, dogmatic in his uh, approach uh, to the rules, and 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 I think uh, like Chigorin ended up winning those games uh, against Steinitz because he was uh, better at evaluating uh, the positions. Yeah, and you can also find find that game on uh, on Martin's. Um... YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of useful stuff in here. I um, 
Yeah, and I think the the the, the when you scroll through the book, there's like there's there's, there's some small uh, snippets, highlights of text where where uh, Lipnitsky comes with uh, some uh, some uh, really good uh, quotes uh, that is like uh, um, yeah, so, so there's there's sprinkled out through the book. I think so. There were some chapters that I thought was a little bit uh, yeah. Uh, not so useful, maybe, uh, uh, and where it was, uh, uh, how how long does a, a novelty last? Where it was, I think the, the the main idea I got out of that chapter was that sometimes it lasts long and sometimes it lasts not so long. <laughs> so I I, I, I knew, didn't really see any point with that chapter, and it was like four pages long, uh, and uh, and also. Um, yeah, how is a, is an innovation born? Uh, was a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I felt like there was some some chapters that was uh, a little bit weaker. Maybe maybe I, I couldn't find the the connection to to the other parts of the book in in those. Yeah, and also just naturally, like again, from from a book published originally in the nineteen fifties, yeah. there's yeah, going to be some. <laughs> There's going to be some outdated stuff. And I yeah. think how an innovation born, like innovations are born a lot differently uh, now than they are. So, yeah, I also felt like it, the book uh, started strong. Then the the middle few chapters evaluating the position, the concrete approach and from critical positions to settled positions, those were outstanding. And then it, it's it uh, as you say, it started to drag a tiny bit. But then when I got to the the games and the appendix, it, it just sort of came back with a flourish. And and for those, of course, because it was all full games, um, I was able to input them into Lee Chess as I was uh, reviewing them. And uh, um, I was really impressed with the quality of the moves, the quality of the analysis, even the, the Lee Chess like, uh, score calculator. I mean, they were like modern GM quality games just in terms <laughs> of like his son upon loss. Um, and they were instructive, more importantly, on top of that. So, um, yeah, that just really, really stood out to me, especially, again, because the guy wasn't, you know, didn't have the Grandmaster title. But just to, to see the clarity and the the you know of course there's one or two calcu there's one or two uh, analytical mistakes you're never gonna gonna catch everything but the uh, overall it was super impressive uh, I mean some one other thing for like students of the classics um, for any old chess book of course there's gonna be some you know a bit of redundancy in terms of the games that you see like the Anderson Kizaretsky Immortal Game. Um, is, is a very famous one, which, by the way, the uh, the the modern engines are not a big fan of that game. But uh, but uh, Botvinnik Capablanca it was this very famous game where uh, Botvinnik plays uh, Bishop A3, uh, deflecting the uh, deflecting the queen, and then mates him on the king side. Steinitz von Vorderleben. So there's several yeah. like you know first ballot Hall of Fame <clears> type <throat> games, but. That's yeah. again. That's to be expected, and it's always nice to see how different authors weave them in. Yeah, and and uh, and it, like he in the chapter nine, he has a chapter on uh, he calls positional flair, and uh, yeah, and and he he, he, uh, he talks about like the, the idea of studying chess is like you, you get a feel for the position if you if you study chess, and there's like there's a, a quote um, that maybe can inspire people to 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 study these games uh, like where he says uh, a thoughtful uh, deep study of chess uh, in conjunct conjunction with the tournament practice serves to develop that valuable quality of positional flair without which no one can think of uh, becoming a strong player um and i thought okay yeah it's 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 uh, it's important and uh, um to get this uh, positional flair and and I, and I just thought about when I listened to the rabbit and blitz commentary with the with the Peter Ligo uh, this uh, this last day said so when every new position he instantly recognized the the, the positional ideas in 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 the available and what is the main idea and and I think Sometimes uh, for for amateur players, uh, you feel like you're landing in some new land, and you don't un really understand what's happening. Uh, but the grandmaster he is uh, always has some idea plans, 
uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to lean on. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that was another sort of major theme of the book is sort of the inextricable link between the opening and the middle game. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's something that's come up in the recent discourse because obviously Chessable, shout out to Chessable, is amazing for helping you remember moves. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also uh, have have a general idea of the the the, the tabias, the the um, typical plans in a position. So be sure to review if you're doing a chessable opening course. Be sure to review the illustrative games that are provided, and nothing should stop one from going for um, you know looking beyond that to even more illustrative games. Um, and you know, yeah, again, it's impressive that he was writing this and just example after example of sort of how like the opening and the middle game are just uh, connected at the hip and you really can't, can't study one without studying the other. Yeah. And, and I think he has some points about uh, like, uh, I, I make the mistake uh, sometimes when I, in the opening, I see my opponent's move. I, I look at the move he, he, he just made instead of uh, Lipnitsky would say like, I need to look at my opponent's plan and try to, to combat that plan where I think, I, I sometimes like I look at the move. What what, the, what does that move do in this position? But uh, in in a deeper sense, I need to look at the plan and see: is it a weak plan or is it is, is it a strong plan? I should continue with my own plan here. And uh, yeah, and and he says that also that in uh, many other uh, chess theoreticians has like uh, said that the opening. It's just the mobilization of the pieces while uh, while he goes into saying that the plans in the middle game starts already in the opening. And so you don't just need to mobilize the pieces as quickly as possible, but you also need to uh, do it in a way that uh, accommodates uh, plans uh, in the middle game. So that's a little, a little bit of a harmony between the opening and, and, and middle game where he says that the opening is uh, like the initial mobilization, while the the middle game is the coordination of the pieces. I don't. I th maybe he borrowed that from Capablanca. I can't really remember. Yeah, I, I don't remember offhand either. But um, <laughs> overall, I mean, overall, as you say, it's a great, great positional guide, and I would say that is kind of the the primary type of uh, improver for whom this book is most useful. Of course, if you're trying to work on your tactics. Um, you you know you should use a tactics book or a tactics trainer or a tactics course. Um, and end games, of course, the, next month we'll be covering uh, the classic end game strategy um, with uh, with uh, Kevin from the Chess Journeys podcast. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about end games next month. Um, but but for if you're if you feel like you don't know where the pieces go. When you get out of the opening, this is one of the books that can help you along with uh, with books like Simple Chess um, and along with the, the School of Hard Knocks, of course. Um, so um, and one other small quibble with the book, and I've noticed this in uh, lots of older books, is it, it kind of ends suddenly. Um, yeah. <laughs> it happens with a lot of chess books. I'm not I'm not sure why that is. I guess it's kind of hard to have a good good a big goodbye when a book is primarily, you know, designed to be in instructional. But overall, uh, yeah, definitely just strong recommendation, basically. Do you have anything to add, Martin? I do want to talk about your current book project a bit and yeah. uh, wrap up a few things. But but anything else we should, uh, you'd like to share? Mm, I, I have I have the same feeling about the book, like uh, the, the, the harmony of the, 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 the flow uh, in the book is a little bit, Strange, maybe also why I wanted to know how the original book was was presented. Uh, but uh, overall, I feel like it's uh, it has uh, immense value and 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 can be uh, read and reread uh, several times. I think I, I will definitely go uh, through this book again uh, uh, because I think these games are really instruction instructional and uh, yeah. And 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 it's a good reminder also if you feel like if uh, your positional chess needs uh, 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 reworking, uh, then uh, then I think that's some great example. And and uh, and I also think that Lipnitsky is like a a positional kind of player. Uh, it's my my feel of his uh, his games and uh, his uh, attraction to to chess. 
Yeah, definitely not like a crazy attacker. If I mean, he might be a traditional to universal, I would say, but definitely, <laughs> definitely, the games are very sort of solid and principled. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, again, worth checking out. Now, before uh, listeners, before we let you go, one thing we should say is Martin's newest book is actually um, for for those of you familiar with his um, his blindfold endgame visualization. He's doing a blindfold opening visualization, which of course dovetails nicely with um, with the sometime recurring, often recurring feature of a few blindfold puzzles. So once we say goodbye to Martin, which will not be this moment, um, <laughs> then uh, Martin has graciously shared a couple puzzles from the book that I will read uh, for listeners to get a taste of um, of of Martin's book. But Martin, what, what should listeners know about the book? Yeah, it's uh, I, I published uh, the, my first book, uh, yeah, December uh, what, what, uh, one year ago, uh, and uh, then the, then this is the sequel to this first uh, first book uh, because the first book was uh, blindfold puzzles in the in game uh, in game studies and uh, positions, and and this one I, I have uh, taken uh, puzzles uh, from uh, from the first up to ten moves deep uh, into uh, the, the games, and I've looked at often recurring uh, tr tricks and traps in the opening and uh, and made them into uh, 100 um, uh, puzzles uh, and 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 i'm working to publish the the paperback but uh, now is uh, the, the the book is available on uh, on amazon digital and on kindle yeah and and Martin's books are always uh, basically a steal. I mean, uh, last I checked, it was three dollars for this book, and uh, there's well, well more than three dollars worth of value. And uh, as I mentioned at the top, I, I also think Martin's inspiring in that, like he he found he's found a niche. He he found a um, gap in the chess market in terms of both his blindfold books. There's there's not a lot of blindfold training books available and in republishing the uh the capablanca book and and martin you were mentioning before we were recording that the the books uh, your prior two books are selling reasonably well yeah uh, yeah actually i managed to uh, to publish a a, 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 th a third book uh, with a 100 uh Hitting, headachingly hard, uh, made in two. Oh yes, yeah. so I have so, that yeah. one too. How did I forget yeah, that? So, so uh, yeah, I, I think in December here I managed to uh, to sell about over five hundred books, which is uh, kind of mind-boggling when I started uh, a year ago and uh, and uh, I'm a, an amateur chess player here, but I've just uh, got an amazing support from the, the chess community on on Twitter and uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's 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 been fun and uh, and and and, enjoy, and I'm enjoying making these puzzles and getting the feedback. Yeah, well, when you when you give to the chess community, it tends tends to come back around. Uh, I think that's <laughs> been the case. And sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off when you were saying the title of of a uh, hundred. Sorry, I forgot the number. Hundred. Of course, I have the book upstairs. But is it a hundred headachingly hard chess maiden twos or what's yeah, the exact 100 it's the, the title is a bit long, but it's a uh, 100 headachingly hard uh, maiden two puzzles composed by Sam Lloyd. So it's mm -hmm. I've taken uh, the best uh, uh, compositions of Sam Lloyd uh, and made into a, a, a maiden two puzzle book. Um, yeah, and it and I I uh, worked on that book, and I, <laughs> I I like books like that, Martin. I do have to confess, it's one of my it's one of my many books strewn in the graveyard of chess books that I didn't finish. But it's uh <laughs> it's nothing personal. It's my own it's my own laziness. You um, have a lot on the plate. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but it's what I like about a book like that is it's challenging. But if you stick with it hard enough, like long enough, um, at least at my level, you should eventually get it because you're going to look at every single move sooner or later. And it's yeah. only made in two. So um, <laughs> it may take you 10 or 15 minutes, but sooner or later, you should be able to solve it. And yeah. I think that's a, that's a good mix of, again, being challenging, but not being one of these puzzles where when you see the answer you're like well i was just never going to get that you know yeah um, and, I, and i can say like the, in the, the grads to the, the blindfold books it's uh, i'm not a blindfold master in any kind of sense uh, i'm I, I was searching for material because i wanted to 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 learn and, and practice this skill and and i couldn't find anything so that was the motivation to to making the blindfold books yeah so, and of course i've i've plugged improve your chest now which has um 
you know, classic book by Grandmaster Jonathan Tisdall, which which has uh, some blindfold puzzles. And I myself have mentioned that I wish that there were more of those. And by the way, that's a book that I mean, I would say Improve Your Chess Now is a bit more on the uh, psychological side than um, Questions of Modern Chess Theory. But it did remind me of a few modern books that in uh, Street Smart Chess by uh Axel Smith in that it just kind of tackles a sort of a wide array of topics. Um, he doesn't try to answer every question, but just says like, here are some ideas and here are some things that might help how you think about them. Um, so, and Martin, uh, before, before we let you go, uh, we had talked about, again, I would uh, like to make a donation to a charity and in lieu of paying you for all your work from break from your busy schedule. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to hook up chess and slums again. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been following uh, Tunde on uh, on Twitter and and seeing these uh, the boys uh, get, getting to play chess and and seeing the the joy in their eyes is uh, is a, I think it's a good cause uh, to to support. Yeah, fantastic cause. Um, I know I know Levy Rosman recently made a big donation to them, and we try to support them here when we can. And it's fun just to watch Tunde blow up. For listeners who didn't hear his interview, he's a very inspiring guy but it's funny like just today he was tweeting like he's been recognized on the street like five times today or something <laughs> like he's becoming this like huge yeah. star rightfully so yeah. so sh shout out to tunde if uh if you hear this so i think martin we're ready to say goodbye as i said listeners if you're into the blindfold puzzles uh please stick around if you're not then we will catch you um next uh, hopefully at the end of january with a review of the classic book one of my personal favorites uh end game strategy by mikhail sharashevsky so uh thanks again martin well you're welcome i enjoyed ben so oh and uh we should say of course that listeners probably know where to find you martin but you've got um yeah you've I mean, got you a, we didn't plug your newsletter yet your email list yeah, you can uh, you can find me on on Twitter, and there you can also sign up on my newsletter on uh, getreview. Uh, dot com. No, okay, not, but they can uh, get they can get sign up for your email list even if they're not on Twitter, right? Yeah, you can get a link from me, Ben. So okay, so I'll drop the link in the show notes, and uh, and with thanks again, Martin. Welcome back to any of you hardcore chess improvers working on your blindfold visualization skills. I am going to share two of Martin's puzzles with you here from his new book, Blindfold Opening Visualization. So in, in each case, you're looking to find the best move in a given position. I don't want to say anything more than that, but it could be a way to win significant material or it could be checkmate. So without further ado, oh, and by the way, Martin's first puzzle is from the easy category and the second puzzle that we share will be from the intermediate category. So here comes puzzle number one. As always, the link with the moves, the moves will be listed in the show description. If you want to play through them in your head yourself, there will also be a link to a diagram that will have the solution. So you won't risk seeing the solution by looking at the show notes. But if you click through to the diagram, uh, then you would find the answer. So here we go. Here's puzzle number one. It is only five moves before we get to the puzzle. Uh, move one, white plays e4, black plays e5. White plays two, knight f3, black plays two, knight c6. White plays three, bishop b5. So we have a Roy Lopez. Black plays pawn to d6. White plays knight to c3. Black plays knight to e7. White plays knight to d5, moving the same piece twice. Black plays pawn to g6, double question mark. So it is white to move. Find the best move. Once again, the moves are e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, d6, knight c3, knight e7, knight d5, g6, and now it is white to move, find the best move. Uh, on to puzzle number two from Martin. This one, the puzzle will come after seven moves. And again, this one is significantly more challenging than the first one. White goes one, knight f3. Black plays d5. White plays g3. Black plays c5. White plays bishop g2. 
Black plays knight c6. White plays d4. Black plays e6. White castles. Black plays knight f6. White plays pawn to c4. Black plays d takes c4. D pawn takes c4. White plays knight to e5. And black plays knight takes d4 question mark. And now it is white to move. Find the best sequence for white. Uh, it is more than one move to get full credit. Um, and I'll reread the moves. One knight f3. Black plays pawn to d5. White plays pawn to g3. Black plays pawn to c5. White plays bishop to g2. Black plays knight to c6. White plays pawn to d4. Black plays pawn to e6. White castles. Black plays knight f6. White plays c4. Black plays d takes c4. White plays knight e5. Black plays knight takes d4. And now it is white to move. Find the best sequence. Uh, so if you want more puzzles than that, be sure to check out Martin's book. It's actually $5 on Kindle. It is no longer three, but still well worth it. Um, and on that note, uh, goodbye for now. And thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.